welcome to Infocabulary for Specialists. To all of you amazing speech language pathologists, tutors, reading specialists, learning specialists, thanks for joining. I'm Dina Seifert. I'm one of the co-founders along with Beth Lawrence, and this is our first webinar for specialists. We have two specialists joining us and volunteering their time to talk about how they use infocabulary with their students in the classroom and through distance learning. We want you to feel confident using infocabulary with your students and give you some extension activities. You work as a specialist, you, um, your work as a specialist is near and dear to our hearts. Beth Lawrence and I are specialists also, we're speech language pathologists. And while we have literacy apps, we also work with students too. Whether you're a specialist that provides distance learning or you've been thrust into this setting recently because of COVID, we feel your pain and we want to help you during this crisis. And that's why we have offered Infocabulary for free for two months to new users to help you provide vocabulary instruction to your students. During this webinar, the chat is turned off. Your audio and video are also turned off. If you'd like to submit a question, use the Q&A button in your Zoom controls. Some of your questions we will answer in real time and others we'll save for the end when all of our panelists can be together. Because we are recording this webinar, we will send you a link to rewatch it. So if you missed any information or if you want a refresher, you'll be able to view it again. So let's get started. So in this webinar, we will help you understand the semantic reasoning process, which is what infocabulary is based on. Uh, we're gonna give you some multiple uses of how you can use infocabulary with your students, uh, be able to create expansion activities and help you adapt infocabulary for your online learning. We've got two amazing panelists with us today. We've got Caitlin Gentry, who's a middle school learning and support coordinator for the Calvert School in Baltimore, Maryland. And we have Jennifer Knapp, who's a speech language pathologist from the Hamilton School District in Wisconsin. All right, I'm gonna introduce you to the yin to my yang, Beth Lawrence. She's gonna help you, um, she's gonna give you an introduction into infocabulary and then introduce our panelists. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm just going to uh, get started on the background because I'm so excited to hear what, um, what Jennifer and Caitlin are going to be sharing today. So I don't want to take up too much of the time. But just to make sure that we all kind of are coming at this from the same um, vantage point, I just wanted to quickly go over the concepts of breadth of vocabulary versus depth of vocabulary. So in vocabulary is a web, it's a web-based K-12 tool uh, that focuses on depth of vocabulary knowledge and it uses critical thinking so it also improves critical thinking as as we go so breadth of vocabulary is really looking at uh, one's ability to receptively know what a word means in 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 a very shallow kind of way so this kind of a task looks like uh, here are four pictures maybe it's a unicycle a bicycle a tricycle and a train and the student is asked to point to the picture of the bicycle and they're able to say to point to the correct image that doesn't necessarily mean that they deeply know a lot about bicycles and 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 have them connected in uh, in their minds so breadth of vocabulary really is just that kind of surfacey i'm familiar with it and what we found in in the research is that early on, you know, before students uh, came into school, there was some research that found that when students struggled with breadth of vocabulary knowledge, there was a higher correlation with those children and students later who went on to have decoding issues when they got into the literacy, the literacy um, area of, of learning in school. And then with depth of vocabulary, what we're looking at here is really the ability to connect those vocabulary words. So how, um, you know, if the word is compass, it's really understanding, um, you know, that there's a magnet inside and there's a needle on and it has a face and it has a, you know, compass rose. So it's really all that depth of understanding. And then it's the connection of compass with a watch right? Because those are both tools that, that give you information uh, and they, they measure things. Um, and also it would go in the camping uh, 
category because it would, you know, so it would go with a tent perhaps or Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. So that's really what we're looking at with depth of understanding. Um, and what the early research found with students who struggled with depth of vocabulary um, knowledge is that they were the students who went on to end up with comprehension issues uh, when we got into literacy. So this is a, an abbreviated version of the TEDx talk that I was fortunate enough to do last year. So it's just about five minutes. So we're gonna go ahead and play that for you. It goes into um, just a little bit more about semantic reasoning, how it came about. Words are the building blocks of oral and written language, and by extension, all learning. We have learned a lot over the last 20 years about best practice vocabulary instruction. Unfortunately, it's not always playing out in the classroom. And the reason is, it is time consuming. And it uses a lot of language. In a pinch, many of us fall back on an old standby, the flashcard. To fully get why semantic reasoning works, it's helpful to think about how typical vocabulary development works. We don't tend to use a lot of sophisticated vocabulary when we're speaking, but authors do. As students move through those early elementary years, hopefully they learn how to read. And then, upper elementary through high school, it's a lot of reading in order to learn. Every word encounter a student has with a particular word, gives them the opportunity to encounter that word in a variety of different contexts. And this is a cumulative effect. The result is depth of word knowledge and highly connected word networks. It is the avid readers who are the ones with fantastic vocabularies. So what happens when students are not avidly reading? There are many, many ways that this typical vocabulary learning process can be derailed. My training and my tendency encouraged a lot of explaining and informing and guiding that thinking process through art and graphic organizers and acting things out, yes. But mostly, it was from a lot of talking and written language. Since Panina was not an avid reader, she had not encountered those great nuanced words. After a particularly harrowing uh, session with her, where I deeply taught her the meaning of the word prominent, a week later, she informed me emphatically that prominent means short. Uh, rarely speechless, I rushed to my office. I pulled out her student file, and on a hope and a prayer, I searched for something, anything, that would give me a clue how I could reach this student. How? Had I forgotten this? Here was a student who had superior, genius-level nonverbal learning, non learning skills, and her verbal skills significantly lower. My aha moment was that I had been using language to teach language to a student whose primary struggle was language. Because Panina struggled to read, she hadn't been encountering those great words like, like prudent and prominent. And then all the flashcards she was doing in class, those weren't helping. And then there I was, with all my language. What about the idea of providing her with the equivalent of multiple years of word encounters, but doing so in a condensed, visual way. I found pictorial representations of the word prominent, put them on a page with just the word prominent at the top. 
I was prepared with language as a support if needed. I had captions in mind for these images. But Panina took a look at this and in six seconds flat informed me, oh, prominent means to stand out in some way. I was floored. And then she was able to give me two additional examples. Learning had occurred. So this activity asks students to find the common thread among the images using their critical thinking skills, and then choose which one word goes with all four images. It's prominent. <laughs> In 2015, Dr. Michael Kennedy at the University of Virginia conducted a small study. What he found was students scored far higher the weeks they learned words using semantic reasoning than they did when they used business as usual instruction. And the reason why was that students were far better able to apply their newly gained knowledge of those words to new contexts. That was kind of the genesis of Infocabulary was this one student um, and then Infocabulary would never have happened if I hadn't partnered with my, my, uh, my, my twin, my, <laughs> my business twin. So uh, Infocabulary has got, has, um, you know, those were the roots, but um, we've developed this together. So some of the things that, you know, as speech language pathologists, reading, uh, reading specialists, language therapists, um, these, are, these are the recommendations that have been made to us in terms of making sure that our vocabulary instruction is, is deep and, um, and that it sticks. Um, and so these are, the, these are some of the top recommendations for uh, gold standard uh, best practice vocabulary instruction, making sure kids are actively engaged. If they're just sitting there bored to death, we've already lost them before they started. Making sure that we're addressing words um, with multiple contexts, uh, you know, that, that it's not just, um, you know, oh, here's one example. Uh, making sure that we're using visuals. So many of our students really benefit from that pairing of visual and audi uh, audi auditory. Uh, making sure that we're addressing morphology, uh, the parts of words, root words, uh, prefixes, suffixes. Semantics, highly, highly important, and that's where using graphic organizers is really helpful. How does this word relate with this word? Um, if you're doing a, an activity on uh, shelters, for example, which shelters are for animals and which shelters are for people? Which ones are temporary? Which ones are uh, permanent? And, and that's another really um, helpful, there are lots and lots of helpful activities that go along with this in this fantastic book called Bringing Words to Life. Um, and that's Beck McCown and Kukan. So um, they're very, very popular. If you do not own this book, run, do, well, don't run. Type Amazon, get this book. Um, it will really, really help ramp up your, your vocabulary instruction with students. Uh, and then kinesthetic, getting kids up, moving around, acting words out um, is super important as well. And then of course, the, um, the one that we all definitely know, repetition. So in vocabulary 2.0, we just released and um, up at the top is the link to um, showing you a very short video on that. We're just going to give you the, the, um, the background on that. And, um, and then this is what it looks like now. So um, we modified this screen. So it used to be a real mountain. Everything that all of the content that's in Infocabulary is still photographs, images, um, but we designed this so that we could um, have students do more activities on their way up the mountain. And we'll go over that in just a little bit, but let's take a look at this video. Most programs that teach vocabulary tell the meanings of words as a first step, but learning the context for words usually takes a lot more time and requires students to be avid readers. Infocabulary uses a new approach called semantic reasoning, so students learn word meanings more deeply while improving their critical thinking as well. Students are climbing up mountains, engaging in three types of activities along the way. Base camp, ascents, and expedition. For each activity, students are given a certain number of carabiners. Those are the tools that keep mountain climbers safe while they climb. Students earn between one 
and three stars for each activity type. If the carabiners run out, students must repeat that segment before moving on. They always have the option to redo a segment if they desire to earn more stars. Now, let's take a look at Basecamp. This is where students deeply learn the meanings of words and the various contexts they can be associated with. They figure out the meanings of words by using inductive and deductive reasoning. They hear and see words exposed and look for the common thread among the images and use clues within the captions to guide their thinking and help them formulate their own definitions for words. When the paper ripped, the page behind it was made visible. Made visible. We waited a long time, but finally we can see the baby chick. Finally we can see it. We don't usually get to see what's behind a wall, but since it was cut open, we can now view the wires. Can now view. She didn't know what was in the present, but now it can be seen. Now it can be seen. The bear is spreading his lips so that his teeth can be seen. Can be seen. Hmm. Most tree roots are hidden under the ground, but those are not. Most are hidden, but those are not. Teachers also have the ability, and students as well, to show all the captions in case they want to search for the words and phrases. Then I'm just going to go ahead and turn all the audio off to save us some time, but uh, students then build the definition. And then they're given three choices, describes, and then I'm given the entire definition. Ascent is where students must find the common thread among four images and choose the one word out of four that best goes with all four images. Again, the captions contain clues that help scaffold student understanding. When I choose the right word, I'm shown the definition. And if students want to use the metacognitive strategy of hiding the wrong answers, they can do so. Expedition is where students apply their understanding of words by choosing two words that go together the best, synonyms or related words. So here I'm trying to find the two words that are related, frail and fragile. If I want to hear the words read aloud to me, each of the boxes has an audio button. Let's see here. Barely any and scarce. Mischievous and wicked. Prominent and striking. And there will always be one that is left over. Once students complete all of their base camps and ascents and expeditions, and if they want to complete uh, all of their stars, they reach the top, they summit, and they get a new mountain and continue with more words. Okay, so just as a reminder, um, there are the three modes. Um, base camp, which is kind of the learning mode. It looks like this, six images, and you, the students have to help uh, build the definition. And the next one is Ascent. And that is the game or the quiz mode. Um, and I'll let Jennifer and um, Caitlin talk more about this. But um, a lot of times people will use this as a pre and a post test if they want to look at um, students' performance over time. Uh, and so this is where uh, the students are choosing the one word that goes with all four. And then the next one is just a quick screenshot, Ascent. That's the one where it's, it's, you could see it's more sophisticated. It's more, there's a lot more cognition that's going on to try and find those common threads among the words. Okay. So we, um, we've created a video for student specialists. Um, and I'm thinking that we should um, 
postpone this because I'm so excited to get to our speakers today. And I know they have tons of great uh, experiences that they want to share with you. So if we have time at the end, let's come back to this one. Um, if not, it's on our YouTube channel and you can watch it. It's specifically designed for the specialist so that you can see what the dashboard looks like. And we've added, um, we've added another piece that I think Jennifer's going to talk about the word extractor. So anyway, make sure that you go to that if we don't have time. All right. So next is, without further ado, I will introduce, here's Kate, and she is um, a friend of mine. I have known her for several years. I live uh, in Baltimore, and uh, she is the middle school learning and support coordinator at the Calvert School in Baltimore, Maryland. So we're really, really lucky to have her on uh, today. Without further ado, I give you Kate. Thanks, Beth. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I am so honored to be able to share um, truly what's become a passion for InfraCabulary with everyone here today. Um, I had the fortune of being able to be one of the first testers of InfraCabulary years ago when the program was first launched and have just seen such incredible um, outcomes for my students, um, both the students that I work with who have language learning challenges as well as our students in general, um, which has been incredible. So um, I think InfraCabulary, especially now, is an incredible resource as we are navigating online learning, which obviously is such a challenge. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about how I used it in person, um, mainly because I am nostalgic for the days of being person to person with my students. So um, InfraCabulary was truly a, a foundation of our program. Um, we have groups of students who we work with every day for an hour. Um, we were using InfraCabulary three times a week with these students. And um, it's a pretty incredible program in that I found it to be just as useful in a group setting as well as individual, um, whether I'm working with a student or a student is working through the program independently. So when we were doing it as a group, we would gather around. I would begin by modeling what I was seeing, the inferences I was making. Um, and it was pretty incredible to see the students then taking that language and trying that on. Um, as all learning specialists know, the time with your students is, is challenging to uh, navigate when you have more than one student at a time. So InfraCabulary was also great. I could do a reading fluency check with one student as I knew another student was getting high level vocabulary instruction independently. Um, and it's always my students go to if we finish a lesson early, the first thing they ask to do is, oh, can I try to do one more climb on InfraCabulary? So I know it's working. Um, they've found that magic mix of engaging gamification with real learning, which I don't feel like a lot of other people have figured out yet. Um, so one of the biggest things that I really enjoy watching with InfraCabulary is my students now owning language. Um, students who have struggled with language now have this rich, robust vocabulary. They're recognizing words. They're using the words in their writing. I'm hearing from their English teachers that they're using these really high level true true words. And that's just, um, you know, warm, warms my heart. Um, and it's also neat to see that confidence that comes um, with knowing these words. One of the greatest pieces of vocabulary is it pulls a lot of words from the novels that they're already reading in English class. So not only are they learning these words, then they're in English class and a word will come up and they're the first ones to know that definition and they can really understand it. They haven't just memorized a definition, which we all know doesn't really work anyway, um, but they have this deep understanding of what that word means, which is so exciting and so exciting for them. Um, the other piece that I absolutely love with this program, and again, these two women are miracle workers. I don't know how they managed it, but it is a game for students, but it really has been designed in a way that my students with ADHD or executive functioning who tend to rush through games, um, whether it's a Kahoot or a Gimkit, where they're just rapidly quick clicking through things to try to earn points, this program slows them down. They actually understand what they're learning. They're, um, you know, internalizing everything that's in front of them, um, whether it's through the sentences, through the games that are so fun. They don't have the option to just click, 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 um, which is really a game changer for me, frankly. Um, 
the other piece of our program that um, I'm sure mirrors what some other learning specialists have as well is we also are working with our really enriched students, um, which is an awesome opportunity for me to see how infotabulary helps those students as well. So when I hear from parents, you know, my daughter loves to read, what else can we do? The first thing I do is put them on infotabulary, um, not just because it's an amazing vocabulary program, but I've also found my really enriched students need the opportunity to learn how to be a little bit more flexible. Here is language in a new way. You're looking at not just rote memorization, which unfortunately they're all, or fortunately, I guess, they're all really good at. Here is breaking down language in a different way. Um, I like to think of it as low stakes, high reward. They can take these risks on these games, learn new vocabulary, while also working on some flexibility that some of those students really need to develop. Um, so I'm sure like all learning specialists, the biggest piece is getting buy-in. Um, and that has been, you know, part of this process. I've always been able to use it with the students that I work with in a one-on-one -on -one basis or small group or when they drop in during the day. Um, but it's been really exciting getting some teacher buy-in. So one of the best ways that I have found to do that is to help teachers see that infotabulary is not only going to mirror, but it's going to enrich what the teachers are already doing. So I have one quick slide um, that shows kind of this simple thing that I did with teachers. My sixth grade English teacher is just incredible. She has this really, really robust curriculum that she loves, but she was finding that students, when they were taking her vocabulary test, wink, nudge, she's not all the way onto in vocabulary yet, but that's okay, we're making progress. Um, she was finding that the students might know the definition of intimate, but they were having trouble answering questions about the word. So she might say, okay, um, who is someone that you have an intimate relationship with? And then the students would respond with something like, I intimate my mom. And that is not what we are looking for. Um, and so InVocabulary does a really nice job and it's been awesome seeing my students work through this and, and helping her see how InVocabulary not only shows them the foundation of what the word means, this deeper understanding of the word through the images, but then they look at the pictures and the sentences. So we practice plugging the word in, where would this go? So my pets absolutely love each other. They're inseparable. My pets have an intimate relationship. Something as simple as that. And then repeating it, as uh, Beth mentioned, that repetition piece, so they get more and more comfortable with owning that definition and using it in different contexts. It is something that can happen with people or pets or whatever it may be, um, which has been really neat. Another um, teacher that has been awesome to work with is a big advocate of learning words through books, which in theory is fantastic, as long as we have students that are reading a lot of the books. Um, and I don't know about all of you, but unfortunately in 2020, there's other things to do rather than read. So students aren't reading as much as they need to. So in vocabulary has bridged that really well in that we have the novels that they're reading in those grade levels. And so we can say, yes, yeah, they are learning these words from the book but they're learning them in a really meaningful research-backed way versus the one exposure of that one word in a sentence that the students may or may not understand. So it's been a great way to take kind of an old school approach to learning vocabulary and really expand it and deepen the student's understanding and help the students um, feel comfortable and confident in the class and the teacher feel comfortable and confident navigating that. Um, so as we transition to online, um, my next slide is a quick little image of what we've all navigated recently. Um, this is an activity one of my uh, boys did just yesterday. We are in a predicament. Um, I often will have them make quick slides that represent things that they have, a new word that they've learned. Um, they pick new words that they think uh, are new images that they think represent the word. Um, and I often feel like the cat in this image for sure, um, with the water swirling around us in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but, uh, Online learning, um, I do have to say the unfortunate nature of online learning has actually been a wonderful silver lining in that now we are really launching in vocabulary across the board. Um, all of our seventh graders are now using it and it's so incredibly exciting to see them delving in. Um, our teachers are delving into it. My students who have used it for years get to be the experts on language, which is not something they get to do a lot. Um, and we also have launched it with our approach to getting prepared, our students take an upper school placement test. Um, and seeing what InVocabulary has done for my students 
we've made the decision to use in vocabulary as a support for all seventh grade students as they begin this process. And my English teacher and I were speaking today and she said, I just never knew there was an approach to verbal reasoning besides flashcards. And now I can make these assignments and the students love it and they're learning the words and it's just so amazing. So it just has been an incredible experience for me to be able to use in vocabulary to connect in so many new ways that I really hadn't anticipated with this virus. And now all of a sudden, we are able to expand in vocabulary use. My students with language learning challenges have become the experts in the classroom. And I'm confident that the growth that we've seen with my kiddos is now going to translate to all students as they are delving into this new resource that just has been so incredible. I wanted to quickly show two other quick images that my students sent me uh, yesterday and today. So one of my favorite things is my students, as I said, you know, show me images that they come up with, um, and they often will include something that the word reminds them of. So one of my adorable seventh graders felt that Welter reminded her of New York City, and I just thought, what an awesome experience to picture New York City and to think of that word. Whereas I know if I was just having her memorize a word and a definition, that was not going to happen. And then I have the, the next slide um, is a, a, an adorable image of the word obsolete and a very frank response. The word obsolete reminds me of an old rocking chair. I don't know why, but it does. And just the absolute honesty of a middle school student, I have this connection, I'm not sure why. And then when we come together every Friday to do in vocabulary as a group, it's a wonderful chance for us to say, okay, you thought of rocking chair, you thought of this. Where were you coming from with all of that? Um, and just get that engagement going um, just over a Google Meet. It really does feel like we're almost back in the classroom again. Um, and until we are back in the classroom in vocabulary, is really bringing us together to have that experience. So. Beth and Dina, thank you so much for the opportunity for me to share this. It has been such an incredible program when we were in person and truly a godsend now that we are learning remotely. It's, it's really reassuring to know my students, even though they are remotely learning, um, are still developing these incredibly important vocabulary skills. So thank you both for this amazing program. Thank you so much, Kate. That was, that was um, really helpful to, to just hear what's going on with this in the trenches. So thank you so much for taking the, I know you're super busy. So um, I next will introduce uh, Jennifer Knapp. She is a speech language pathologist in Hamilton School District in Wisconsin. Uh, Jen did a presentation with us at the American Speech Hearing Association last year. Uh, and that's when we realized, uh, Dina and I realized, we're going to keep what we talk about to a minimum and just let these brilliant people speak. So without further ado, um, I know Jennifer has a lot of um, cool information to also share. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very, very much, Beth. You are more than uh, kind on all of this. So I'm going to share my pages real quickly here. I started, I've always felt that like, obviously visuals are the way to teach vocabulary. Even in uh, 2012, there was a, a website out there. I don't know if anyone else has, is familiar with it, but it was called Inside Story Flashcards. And as much as I understand, it was a person, a photographer who was basically interested in taking pictures and then they attached them to, you know, a high level or tier two words. Sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once, which I should know better than to try and attempt. All right. And so for my SLO at the time, I don't know how many of you are familiar with SLOs, um, but my big idea was I was going to increase a set of students, their vocabulary by 100 words using these visuals from in, um, Inside Story flashcards. And I created an entire curriculum around it. I met every week and at the end of it, we used Quizlet and 80% of the class scored above 90% on the Quizlet. So they had acquired their 100 words and I was incredibly proud of myself. And the next semester, I happened to be reading with a group of two or three of them, and a few of the words popped up in a completely unrelated story. And I asked them, hey, those are you know, words that we talked about. Do you remember what they mean? They didn't have a clue. They didn't, they didn't even recognize them. It wasn't that they couldn't expound on them. They really could not even recognize it. And that is when I realized um, that's not gonna work. It didn't work. 
So a hundred words, a whole semester for nothing. And so I kind of toiled around, looked for some other um, programs, really couldn't find anything until a colleague had suggested in vocabulary. And so three years ago, I picked it up and I have been using it ever since. Um, right away, what I recognized was that in vocabulary, has so many more applications than just increasing vocabulary recognition. Um, I started using it with a student who had very limited expressive language, almost jargon-like. Um, she had very high anxiety, and so really she wasn't going to generate her own information. She figured she'll use something she'd heard from someone else. And so when I asked her to um, use some of the target sentence, I'm sorry, target words in a sentence, the target word I think was pride. And she said, he was pride in eating the pie. And so again, there you go. Maybe she understood what the definition of the word was, but, um, or she could recognize it, but she wasn't able to use it in a sentence. So after several, um, I would say, I think two semesters, we started applying in vocabulary once a week, and this was what I got, I, I apologize, this is a, a year and a half later. The asteroid was hurtling through the solar system. Now, that's pretty impressive. In my opinion, I feel like that's a huge jump. And this is using the system, uh, using in vocabulary with some discussion and some additional activities. We usually start with a sentence generation task. Um, and since we've moved to online learning, what I do now is I just, cut and paste in in vocabulary you have the opportunity to see their most recent um, acquired or mastered words and learned words and so what i do is i'll take a screenshot of the words that you know depending on mastered versus learned and i will put them on a google doc share it to them so that they can be working on a sentence generation task while i'm working on a fill in the blank so that also keeps me from having to do a ton of prep i can do it in the moment and again, it's a nice way to kind of warm up and review the words that we've already covered. So as you can see, just the other day, I think this is, yeah, from 415, she picked parachute and a parachute is a colored tarp that people use to play fun games. I didn't, I mean, tarp, that's amazing. She obviously got that from using the program. Now this young lady also, um, for whatever reason, she has glommed onto this so much. I believe that she is now at 1,292 words. Um, so obviously what my concerns and what some staff member concerns um, surface were, well, she's just memorizing the pictures. She's just, you know, kind of clicking through, clicking through, clicking through. But the fact that she was able to generate TARP, TARP is nowhere in this word list and TARP certainly wasn't anywhere, you know, sitting out. So that tells me that she is getting this from this repeated exposure paired with the pictures. She feels confident. She knows what to expect with it. And I have this experience with several other students as well. So, you know, you heard Beth talking about the, um, the depth of a vocabulary word. I, I call it the relation foundation with my students. And this is a list of connections or associations. It continues to grow as, as we work, students have added. The one I had was literally um, almost reduced to tissue paper. It was so, you know, and I wanted to put that up there, but. Uh, it, I guess it looked too disgusting, so I had to recreate it. Um, but these are common associations and ways that I use these whenever we're working with words and in vocabulary. So for example, the word is heirloom. I have the students go through and identify which words from the captions are the strongest associations to the target word heirloom. And basically, the, I just take my data until they're able to give me three to five words for each um, of the target words. And that's, once we've gotten to that point, then I'm able to use that strategy. So now we're not just talking about learning vocabulary words. Now we're also talking about learning a strategy that you can apply to, I apologize, I forgot this slide was in here. So this is how we document them because I really want the students remembering it's not just generations of family, but generations of family associates with heirloom because it tells who might um, have an heirloom or who might pass down an heirloom. And this step I have found is kind of important because the people, actions, descriptions, those kind of provide a mental checklist for my students to make sure that they really understand a word. I've told several of them, you don't really know the word unless you can give me five associations. And that is also something that you cannot get 
from a single like Quizlet or a flashcard. You could put these on a flashcard, but the other thing that my students have learned is then the next time I'm just gonna give them different associations. So I want them to really be able to understand the fluidity of a word and conceptualize it on a pretty big scale because when they get to their curricular tasks or an ACT passage, they're gonna to need to use the same kind of format. So this is something that I took from a practice ACT um, program that we were using. And I would have my students go through and highlight um, you know, which words they felt were critical. Based on the fact that dentures showed up five times, I would teach them, yeah, that's pretty much your hint that that's your key idea. So then what are your other related words? Etruscans, animal teeth, gold bands, wooden, ivory, porcelain, rubber, plastic. Wait a minute. So as they're reviewing the words that they've underlined, it quickly dawns on them, okay, there was a lot of mention of things that they're made of or materials, which beautifully leads into the correct answer for this question. So you're basically just taking whatever strategies you were using here and you're now transferring them to passage comprehension. And then you can take that one step further to um, questions on a on an exam. So this comes from one of our freshman level biology classes. Um, they're learning about mitosis and meiosis and cell reproduction. Um, and some questions you can get away with that, you know, that um, flashcard type practice, right? What phase are sister chromatids separated? Oh, okay, well, that's anaphase because that's when chromatids pull apart. Good enough, no problem. But then you get to the one on the right. And in order to understand this, the answer to this, you have to recognize that it's metaphase and a, that chromosomes meet in the middle. But that's fine, but that's not gonna tell you if it's a plant, an animal, a prokaryote, or bacteria cell. So, but if you did do the process and you understood all of those associations, you could realize, well, first of all, it's definitely not uh, prokaryote because that's the same, you know, that is bacteria, so that knocks out those two because they go through binary fission which is that type of division process. And what this picture is showing has to be either mitosis or meiosis. So now I either have a plant cell or an animal cell. All right, I'm gonna go look and see what other kinds of information. Well, I happen to know that that orange thing is a centromere, okay? So what um, process does, a, or I'm sorry, what cell contains the parts of a centromere? And so if you can see from our graph, animal cell, and that's how you can arrive at the answer. But this takes a long time initially, but if you can get students to get in the habit of thinking about words and concepts that way, they're gonna be able to apply it to multiple contexts, not just learning vocabulary to learn vocabulary. And that's the piece that I feel I really appreciate about in vocabulary is that it gives you repeated multiple approaches to the word so you can practice these skills. At the same time, you're collecting related words so that when you're done with it, you have a nice conceptual understanding of the target word. So you've learned the word and you've learned a thinking process. And I feel like that is invaluable. All right, so this has been my most recent, unbelievably exciting piece of vocabulary. Beth and Dina, I don't know, they must not sleep because they constantly are adding new and amazing things. I will also say that version uh, 2.0 has this wonderful, opportunity at the end where they take your target words in a panel of nine and you can have the students have to decide which two go together and why which is again just reinforcing that understanding that words you don't learn words in a vacuum you have to learn them conceptually um, but the other thing I happened upon the other day was this word extractor and so I started playing around with it and um, I was absolutely amazed I did um, shoot kind of a think aloud um, for a student that I was doing actually today. But before I tried it with a student, I used it with my son. And um, he's, you know, he's a typical eighth grade boy, not really engaged in uh, reading very much. And I had him doing some um, Newsella articles and he was always getting like maybe two out of the four questions right. So I, Newsella happens to have a special area of reading assessments and those have, uh, I believe, eight questions. So I gave him two of those as a baseline and he was getting, you know, three out of eight, four out of eight. And then I tried one article, I ran it through Word Extractor and I pulled out all of the words. And um, actually I'm gonna, re I'm gonna end up repeating myself. So I will have Dina play the video, but the spoiler alert is that on the article that, and I did nothing else, I just had him 
go through the words on his own through vocabulary first. He got a six out of eight. So I realized that's just a single isolated incident, but it was pretty immediate. And he was able to talk to me about the article so much more effectively. So with that, if Dina, you don't mind sharing the video. Okay, so I'm going to go to groups up here and then I'm gonna choose word extractor. And I have a variety of reasons why I use articles for comprehension, we all do. So I'm not gonna get into the specific reason why we're reading this article, but I do have a sophomore. And this was the article assigned to him. It's at a seventh grade level. And so I'm gonna cut it. So I highlight everything, then you hit Control C, go back to Infracabulary and paste it, Control V, give it a few seconds and Infracabulary will pull out all of the words that are in the Infracabulary system. Now, I'm not sure if this was the intention, but inadvertently this has created an awesome starting point that I have now started to use with my students as a way to front load unknown vocabulary words, as well as, and what I feel is even more important, create an anticipatory thinking activity to get them engaged in the reading, all right? So before I assign this though, what's also awesome about Infracabulary is that you can choose the words. Typically, I don't find anything very helpful or highly associated with the zero level. So I just get rid of those right away. And similarly with first grade level words, I might leave important though, because the main idea of this article was the impact of tech jobs on the future. And so I might, you know, get them thinking with that word. Um, I may leave tool. Again, I know they know what these words mean, but I'm activating their background knowledge and trying to engage them in thinking. How are these words going to relate to the main ideas of this article? Um, depending on the kit, I might even leave rainbow in there just because I want them to realize that not all words are significantly associated, but you have to know your student. Okay, so what is great about this is as you get up in the word list, now you might think, this is a 10th grader, why are you using second and third grade words? And that's simply, again, because what you're trying to do is engage them in that anticipatory thinking. How is this word going to relate? And I might leave scary because I happen to know after reading the article that um, it compares and contrasts the opinions or the feelings of generations and that the older generation tends to find tech jobs more concerning or scary. They use the word scary. And I might leave adventure because it is an adventure for some generations. And I also know that respect is important in this article. It's an opinion article and it's being written by a junior in high school who has respect for the older generation. Again, I'm not expecting that my student's going to instinctively pick up on these associations. I'm just planting seeds. And then after that, pretty much everything else I'm going to leave in. I know that down here, Pew is the name of the research center, so it's not the Pew that's going to be an in vocabulary, so I'm going to get rid of that one. And I also know that TINT is an acronym, so I'm going to get rid of that one. So now I have my word list, and I just need to go up here and create an assignment for the classroom. And I think I have made social media article word list, and continue. Okay, and now I have this awesome list that's going to show up in an assignment format with the six pictures, um, similar to the, the typical infracabulary um, format that I can use, as I said, to either front load unknown words, such as some of these up here toward the end of the list, like adaptation, renaissance, um, possibly humanity, although I think he might know that. Again, though, I am, 99% sure that my student can recognize all of these words, okay? But to truly understand them, that's the level that I'm going for. And that's the whole purpose of this activity. So now when my student goes in, I can assign it to this student. And then when they go in, they'll have this and we can use it as a way to talk about what's coming up in the article. And I know we're running out of time, but I just want to challenge anyone who is using Infracabular or was going to be trying it. One of the scariest things I did within the last two or three days was I just clipped a passage from our 20th century history textbook and put it through Word Extractor. The list was three times as long as what just came out of from that Newzella article. 
and it was mind boggling. And I can't even imagine, it makes so much more sense to me. We all know that kids struggle to comprehend that material, but this is exactly why. So I am very, I'm very much looking forward to being able to show that to some of my colleagues because I think that speaks volumes. The only other piece is that I said that the zero level words I usually don't include, but when I noticed the zero level words for the 20th century textbook, they were being used in a more figurative abstract way. So that opens up a whole nother area of discussion for another time. But yes, Dina and Beth are seriously two of the most amazing women. I'm so grateful to them because they've given me a tool that I can use every day with at least 50% of my student population. So thank you. Ah, thank you, Jen. That's I, need amazing. Get, I need some tissues. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm turning on gallery view panelists so you can unmute yourselves and we'll take a few minutes to answer some questions. I just wanted to add one thing to um, sure. that, Jen, you may not know about. Um, you also can filter in the word extractor. You can just click on the grade and it will, and you can type in what grade levels you might be interested in. But I really do love your approach because there's this assumption of what well, kind of the right. idea of like, what's a grade level vocabulary word and yet depth of understanding might have been skipped over in those earlier years. So I just wanted exactly. people to know if you if you don't have quite that level of, you know, that time or whatever, you can just filter by fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth grade words. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Beth, this one might be for you. One of the questions is, I know you're offering in vocabulary for two months for free. What happens after that? How much does it cost? Oh, okay. So um, we are really excited to be helping out in this time. I mean, like nobody had this on their radar. <laughs> um, so we're really happy to be able to help, help out with that for the two months. So when, um, you know, when schools are back to being able to um, afford uh, to purchase products, uh, the price point is based on $7.50 per student per calendar year. So it's a really inexpensive, um tool that can be used <laughs> we've got nodding going on it's an inexpensive tool which we did intentionally um that that really does hit a lot of highlights so seven dollars and fifty cents we also do professional development um we do that web-based obviously we've been doing that web-based anyway um or in person when when things open back up uh and there is a small administrative fee for um for di for adding districts on yeah and we do work with schools on Title I funds or helping them find some funding for it, yeah. correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, let's see. Uh, another question was, where do you get your words for infocabulary? Yeah, I can take that too. So we, tar um, Dina and I, being speech language pathologists, you know, and, and exactly the, the conundrums that, you know, that Kate and Jen, Jen were sharing, uh, we were dealing with. So um, we began our, you know, we began adding words to the system that were those, you, you, we can, those of us on this call, we can look at a text and go, okay, bang, that word, that word, that like, these are the words that are going to throw, you know, our kids for a loop. And this word is a word they're never going to see again in their lives. I'm just going to tell them what that one is, right? So those, those words are the tier two words. So we, um, the, the bulk of the words in infocabulary are those tier, tier two vocabulary words. Um, and then we do also have academic words, uh, the ones that are easily, vis you know, imageable. And we do have, we've been adding tier one words as well. Dina, do you remember when that happened when we first got that request? You wanna share that? Yeah, it was, uh, we were in a school with a high Syrian population and there was, uh, they had EL teachers who were trying to teach these students. And so they said, could you please put lower level words in? And of course we did. And it, we have a lot of EL teachers using a vocabulary with their students. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and then one other question for Jen or Caitlin or both of you, what are some practical ways to use infocabulary with our school's curriculum? So if they have a vocabulary, I'm assuming if they have a vocabulary list or um, something like that, and it's not uh, literature driven, what are some ways that you could use infocabulary? I definitely recommend the word extractor. I mean, that is going to really open everyone's eyes to the impact of vocabulary. And what's amazing is it works so efficiently. It is literally just, you know, cutting it and pasting it in. So 
I would start there. Um, and then you're going to have the task of trying to sort, you know, the topic, I mean, the, um, oh my gosh, the terms, the actual terms that are unknown versus just the tier two reading terms that are going to stand in the way of good comprehension. Absolutely. And I think um, one of the things that we found, some of our teachers who were more wedded to um, vocabulary books, just because that's how they've always taught vocabulary, we actually went through some of the lists and the number of words that are on in vocabulary that are in the vocabulary books as well. I mean, it was incredible. So all of a sudden the teachers were saying, wait, so you mean I can teach them the same words, but they're actually going to learn the words now? I was like, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. So I think that's a really great way is to sit down with someone and show them what's in the program, because as soon as they see the robustness of the program, all of a sudden they don't have the same questions. And I'll add to that, that um, one of the ways that we've heard from a lot of teachers or specialists um, is that you can also filter words by category. So if you are a right, so I'll just pick, you know, if you're a writing teacher and you're sick of saying, look up words in the, in the thesaurus, use more, you know, elegant vocabulary. And then how many of us, I'm sure every person out there is raising their hand right now. How many of us um, have asked kids to look up words in a thesaurus and they put in a hilarious word because they totally don't know what it means. Um, and so um, you're able to uh, choose words by category. So you can, you can decide, I'm going to give my kids 50 or 75 high, um, high frequency adjectives. Or let's say you are a, you're running a social skills group and you want to expand your kids' um, vocabulary for emotions, you could do that. Just search by category, by emotions and feelings, and there are easily three or 400 vocabulary words in there that, you know, from, kind, from, from mad, which they're probably already good at saying, all the way up to enthralled, right? So that's another way that, that I know teachers are using it. Yeah. Um, really quickly, you can also single select to build. Um, we had a vocational skills class that they had to talk about um, their skills and they were, you know, they were coached to use words like um, advocate and flexible. Of course, I can't remember the words now, but we, 20 of them were in in vocabulary, which was plenty for this group. And like three months later, without even thinking about it, this student was in a mock interview and I heard him use like three or four of them. And it was enough for me to go, where is he getting those words from? And I had forgotten that he had had that. So again, not even looking for the data to support the efficacy, it's there. It is so there. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, we thank you for joining us today. Uh, we want to make sure that you're using your infracabulary account. So if you have any difficulties, you have a support button up at the top right hand corner. If you click on support, you will see articles with, uh, for you, you'll click on specialists and we've got articles in there, how to star words, how to add your students. Um, and then there is submit a request at the top of our help desk. So if you submit a request, we'll get that request and help you as soon as possible. If you have any trouble getting your students on, just please reach out because we'd rather you um, take the time to submit a request and ask us than not be using it or not being able to get your students on board. So Steve, I see that we actually have two more questions. Can I? Oh, we do? Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. So one of the questions was, will this webinar be available for me to share with my coworkers soon? And the answer is yes, we are recording, we're recording this. And so we will have that edited and probably next week or within, within a week or so. Oh, yeah, just yeah. with a few days. Mm -hmm. A few days. Um, and then the second question was, is the word list dynamic? How often is in vocabulary updating or adding words? Can SLPs suggest words to be added? And the answer is yes. All the time. Um, we are always, we have a whole content team. It, it started with Dina and me um, with all the hats, you know, and, and as we've grown and expanded, we have an amazing content team. Um, and so we're always adding and tagging words that are in our system with books as well. So our book list is probably, we probably have like 800 by now, uh, about 750 uh, books, uh, titles, ranging from Paddington Bear to Romeo and Juliet. Uh, and so um, the other question, so yes, we're always adding more. We're always tagging words in our system with new books. So you can always send us a list um, and SLPs can suggest words, absolutely. Our only rules are, can't be offensive or, or um, violent. We, oh, what was the one that we had that, that somebody, oh, torture. Someone asked us to add, I'm like, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do that one. Um, there's enough of that on TV. Uh, anyhow, um, so it, it needs to be um, imageable, 
we focus on nouns, adjectives, and adverbs. Um, and um, or if you have a verb, we can turn that into another derivation, adjective yeah. or adverb. Yeah, exactly. So um, absolutely get in touch with us. Um, Beth at Infocabulary would be a great person. Uh, I, I can definitely introduce you to our um, content lead. And you can always click on the support button in Infocabulary and submit a request for that. And then we'd be oh, glad good. to connect you with Leanne, who's the head of our content team. And if you have any questions about sales, Mary at Infocabulary.com would be more than happy to help you. Uh, she can help you work through the funding and, and whatever it is you need. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Jen. You all are amazing. Yeah, thank you all. Totally. We're so, we're so lucky to, to know you ladies and your students are too. So thank you. Yeah, everybody stay safe and well. Yep. Bye.